morning. NICOR Gas, Community Relations Manager. My name is Ry Collins. Um, I'm the Community Relations Manager for Cook County and DuPage County for NICOR Gas. And what that position does is basically when there's an emergency out in the field, a ruptured gas line, and media shows up on the site, um, the field guys call me and I show up to talk to the media, basically the PR person when it comes to uh, these type of things. Prior to this role, I was the field operations supervisor. Okay, so my guys were the ones that went out and dug up the parkways to make the repairs on these type of things. So any questions, feel free to ask as we go along. Um, this should take about an hour, hour 15 minutes, hour and a half, depending on questions. So stop me at any time, please. This is where I'll talk about a little bit about, about our company, how we maintain a safe system, how we respond to emergencies, and I'll take questions as we go along. So AGL Resources is our parent company. Okay, we were acquired by AGL Resources back in 2011. We now have uh, nearly 4.5 million customers. Before the merger, NICOR had 2.2 million. And after the merger, AGL now has 4.5 million. So they, in essence, they doubled in size once they acquired NICOR. That's how big NICOR is um, in relation to their portfolio of uh, companies. We have a natural, natural gas storage facility and then we have retail segment market. They're also based in Naperville. And they're called Pivotal Home Solutions and they offer um, home warranty services on appliances. This is what we maintain and operate. So we have 17,000 square miles of service area. These are all of our regional offices there with the exception of Park Ridge. There's no longer a Park Ridge office. We now have a Des Plaines office. That, and that's the office I'm out of, Des Plaines. Until, um, our Bellwood office is finished being renovated, then I'll be out of Bellwood. Uh, 34,000 square miles, 34,000 miles of pipe that we maintain, 646 communities, and like I said, we have 2.2 million customers. So what's natural gas? Basically, it's non-toxic, non-poisonous, contains no oxygen, it's colorless, odorless, and it's lighter than air, okay? Two things that, that are important on this slide is it's colorless and odorless and lighter than air, okay? So lighter than air meaning it will migrate to the path of least resistance. Once the gas starts migrating, you don't know where it's gonna go, okay? It gets into a sewer, and I'll go through that a little bit later. It gets in a sewer, it can go anywhere. It can migrate laterally. So it will find a path of least resistance where the soil has been disturbed and migrate up. And colorless and odorless, that's why we provide a substance called mercaptan in the gas. Without that mercaptan, customers will not know if they had a gas leak or not because, like I said, it's odorless and it's colorless. So a little bit about uh, the delivery of gas. So we purchase gas from producers and marketers. We have eight interstate pipelines, okay? Uh, so we get the gas in the summer when it's cheap. We pass that cost right on to our customers, okay? So NICOR doesn't make a penny off the gas. Whatever we purchase it for, that's what we provide it for. All right? We make money off the delivery of gas. So all the pipelines that are in the, in the ground, they belong to NICOR. So even if you have a different service provider, nowadays um, different, different uh, marketers market gas and sell you gas, that's fine, but they're still using NICOR's facilities underground. So we're charging you for the delivery of gas. And that's one third of your gas bill. Uh, we have an interstate storage. So we buy gas and we store it underground, okay? So all this miles under the ground, that's where we store the gas until we need it, and then we can introduce it to our distribution system once we need it, okay? So I bought this little thing of marbles. So picture this little jar of marbles, okay? Bedrock, soil, rock. Gas is just pumped down to the bottom and stored underground until we need it, okay? That's what that middle picture is depicting. Gas is stored underground until we need it in our storage fields, and then it goes introduced to our distribution system and sent out to different homes, factories, small commercial, and businesses. So we're getting into gas main now. So in the 1800s, that's the gas main that we use. Just wooden main. It's a hollowed out piece of wood, and that's how gas was delivered back in the 1800s during the Lincoln and Douglas debate. After that, we moved into steel, okay? We still got a lot of steel out there right now, and we will always have steel in the ground, okay?
We're in the process right now of getting, getting rid of all of our bare steel though. All of cast iron, all of our copper services, and all of our bare steel will be out of the ground within the next three years, okay? So there's some advantages and disadvantages of steel. Okay, what do you think the advantages of using steel is? What's that? Hard. It's hard, strength, yep, yep. So when contractors dig around that, uh, they would much rather dig around steel than plastic. A lot of cases, that's how they that's how they find our services. Chip away at it with their backhoe. Once they hit it, they know they found us. And now they can, you know, work accordingly and finish hand digging and find out, you know, and, and get the excavation depth that they need. Okay. The bad part about it is when they do hit us, they may knock a piece of wrapping off. So before I go into that, what's the disadvantages of using steel? Anybody? What's that? Rust degrading. Correct, corrosion. This is a steel service. Look how pitted and corroded it is. And I'll start, I'll pass around props and you can just pass them all around. Into the corner, steel service, corroded. Okay, as a matter of fact, we got an entire department, a corrosion department that deals just with that, corrosion and protection of pipe. Okay, this green pipe you see up here, that's steel. This is a two inch gas main. Okay, steel, but it's coated. Okay, it just has a plastic coating. All right, and this is basically the coating right here. This is the coating, and that protects the pipe from corroding. Okay, it's just a plastic coating around the steel pipe, and that keeps it from corroding. So, another problem with contractors hitting our gas main, whether it's steel, bare steel, or corroded steel, if they hit a piece of steel main and it's coated, Okay, they may think, okay, we just nicked it, no problem, we'll backfill it, we won't call the gas company. But if they hit it in one spot and knock the piece of that wrapping off, guess what's gonna happen to that spot over the years? It's gonna rust in that spot, okay? It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. That spot will corrode and rust, and we will have a leak there at some point, okay? And like I always mention, it'll, it'll always be at midnight on Christmas Eve, or the coldest day of the year, okay? We have to get out there and chase a leak because a contractor nicked our main and didn't let us know. Okay? Another advantage of steel is you can locate it. Okay? Contractors can locate a steel main because that's what they're locating. They're locating the steel. In 1990, we went over to plastic, polyethylene, what we call PE. Okay? This is very easy to use, it's flexible. This is a PE trailer, okay, with a coil of PE on it. They also come in three foot sticks, okay? So there's some advantages and disadvantages of using uh, plastic. What would you say the advantages of for plastic? Cheaper. Cheaper, correct. That's one advantage. You can get a plastic service. This is a one inch service right here. You get this for about nine cents, 10 cents a foot. So it's cheap, okay? Another advantage, like I mentioned, is it's flexible. You don't have to use as many elbows in 90s to maneuver around sewer, okay? It's flex. You can go up and down, you know, whichever way you need to go. A uh, couple disadvantages, though. What do you think the disadvantages of plastic? Breaks. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Right there, a real two-inch gas main. I was hit by a backhoe. Puncture that thing, contractor dig with a bore, a boring machine or, or a backhoe. They'll hit that and they won't even know they hit it. Okay, a hydraulic bucket will go through that like hot butter. They won't know they hit it until they have 60 pounds of gas blowing up right at their faces. Okay, so we tell them as soon as they hit it, stop, because they their machine, their backhoe instantly becomes a source of ignition for an explosion when you have gas blowing up and you're operating a piece of machinery. Okay. Here's another one. Just tore right through it. Okay. 60 pounds of gas. Trying to escape out of that hole. Okay. Now, another disadvantage, a couple more disadvantages of using plastic. One, you can't locate it. Okay. So having that thing in the ground is just like having that plastic Coke bottle in the ground. It's just a piece of plastic in the ground. This is how we locate it. Okay, this locate wire, 
We attach this right to our gas mains, and this is what we're actually locating when we're out there locating our mains. Okay. So you'll see this at your home. You'll see this piece of yellow wire just wrapped around your gas meter like this, and we just leave it just like that. Okay, so we tell customers, do not cut it off. It's there for a reason. So when our contractors, or us, go out and locate this main, <coughs> we're hooking up one end of our locator to this wire, and now we can follow that line, trace that line all the way back to the main, all the way to the customer's home. We can trace it all back, okay? So this is what we use. So you just wrap around a pipe or? It's actually taped directly to the pipe, and I have a little picture that will show that. Um, every couple feet, we'll just tape it right to the pipe with black electrical tape, okay? So if that ever breaks, now we have a main that's unlocatable, okay? Or if that ever gets pulled away from the line, uh, from the gas main, and the, and the line is over here, but the gas main is over here, that locate's going to take you over there where that line is, not necessarily where the gas main is, okay? So that's why we tape it to the gas main. The next disadvantage of steel, one more advantage, one more disadvantage. The one disadvantage is it causes static, okay? So, advantage is, is we, can, we can repair it easily. If someone gets into this gas main here, it causes a rupture right here. We can squeeze this gas main, just squeeze it. We have mechanical squeezers. I can squeeze this thing flat. You can't squeeze it with your hand, okay? But we have mechanical squeezers that squeeze this flat like a pancake on both sides and it'll stop the flow of gas right here. Okay. okay, so I can squeeze this. But as I'm squeezing it, I'm jeopardizing the integrity of this pipe now. Okay, it's just like a rubber band. Once you squeeze, stretch a rubber band, it's never, it's never the same anymore. Same as this pipe. You squeeze it, you're causing static as you're squeezing it because you're putting a lot of pressure on it and um, that causes static. Remember, as we're squeezing it, there's still 60 pounds of gas flowing through it. So you wanna make sure we squeeze slowly to not break the pipe. We have to wet it down every couple minutes with anti-static solution to make sure that static doesn't create a spark, okay? So that's one advantage and disadvantage is using plastic. We can squeeze it to make easy repairs, but it does cause static. Any questions with that? We use different fusing techniques. So, when we use steel to join two pieces of steel together or to um, weld something onto a piece of steel, we have to use welding techniques. With plastic, we fuse. Fusing is just another word of melting. We melt the plastic right together. Okay? <coughs> it's a two inch gas main. Two pieces of two inch gas main joined together by a coupling. Okay, this is, all this is plastic. We hook up our fusion box to these two leads, okay, positive and negative. Turn on our fusion box. A couple minutes, this, this uh, coupling melts right to the plastic. There's coils running through the inside of this coupling, and that's what's actually melting this piece of plastic, these two pieces of plastic together. And they become one. You'll never be able to get it apart. That's a two inch main, okay? It's a four inch main. Two sections of four inch main fused together by a four inch coupling. Okay, and you can look inside. These are not fused together. I just put them together for this training. But that's how we join two pieces of plastic together or splice in a new piece of plastic. Once we cut out the damaged section, we'll splice in a new section. Or even when we're fusing on a T, a service T, to feed a customer's gas service. Okay, so two inch gas main out in the parkway, service T, we fuse that right onto the main. Then we can run down, there's a little, um, there's a little hex screw in here that's sharp on the inside. We can run it down, tap out a chunk of this main, run it up, and that's how the gas flows from the pipe up through the T out to the customer's home. Okay, and that's what's coming up through the meter. So it's basically just like this. Gas main, service tee, running right up to the meter. Okay, but this is attached to the main by fusing. Once again, two leads, hook up our fusion box, positive and negative leads. You can see the coils on this one. 
when I pass it around, you can see the little coil. It melts right onto the tee. And that's what's called electrofusion. Here's the cap for that. These are different types of services that we use and then that we have been using over the years. So pre-1960s, it was steel, okay? I mentioned steel, it corrodes, rust, okay? We still have steel services out there, but we're in the process of getting rid of all of our bare steel. Once all of the bare steel is out of the ground, then we'll go after the coated steel that's, you know, a little older or maybe leaking, okay? In the 60s, over there, we went to copper. The copper service right here. Okay? Um, there's really no advantages to using copper. If we go to a copper service right now and it's leaky, we won't repair it. We will just replace it with the plastic. All of our copper, we're very aggressive, aggressively getting all of our copper out of the ground. Okay? You can't make a repair on that. You can crimp it off until we get there. So if a customer gets into it and um, punctures a copper line, yeah, they may be able to squeeze it off until we get there. But once we get there, then we'll just shut that line down and run a whole new line, okay? Copper rusts. It rusts from the inside out. So as the gas flows through the pipe in a rotating fashion, okay, the inside of that pipe, that copper gets brittle. Now we have flakes of copper airborne in our system coming up through the line, clogging up regulators, pieces of copper floating airborne. So we don't use copper. This one here is PAC. Plastic aluminum composite. Good stuff, plastic exterior, aluminum interior. We can locate it. Okay. You can locate it because it has an aluminum lining inside. And that's what we're actually locating. You can actually locate the copper also, okay? We can make a repair on that. We can squeeze it off. We have a special tool that can squeeze that pack and round it back out once we're done making the repair. Okay. The problem with that is Nycor was the last ones in the industry to use pack or to, to use pack. We we're the last ones in the industry to go to PE. Okay. So because we were the last ones using it, it became very expensive. So we finally got away from using pack, and now we're using PE. This is a picture of the PE with the locate wire taped right to the line, okay? That's a half inch, this is a one inch PE service, okay? Any questions? Excess flow valves, basically uh, valves and there's one going around, the gentleman over there has it. The excess flow valve, I'll spill this from you for one second. Little valve right here, okay? And I have a one inch one there, I'll, I'll pass it around. But they're attached right to the service tee. They're right near the main. Excess flow valve right here. This is that service tee I just passed around. If you look inside, there's a little valve, and it's designed to trip. It's designed to trigger once you have excess flow. So basically, if you're out doing some gardening in your yard on a Sunday, and you're you're using a spade and you puncture your gas line, okay? Instead of having 60 pounds of gas blowing at you by your foundation of your home, the valve in there will trip and it will dimin diminish the pressure of that gas until we can come out and make the repairs, okay? So you don't have 60 pounds of gas blowing right at you or your wife's out doing some gardening, 60 pounds of gas blowing. That excess flow valve will trip, it's designed to trip until we can come out and make the repairs. Okay, then after a couple minutes um, of no pressure going through it, that valve will reset itself. Is that something you guys are just recently starting to do? I didn't catch you. I mean, that's always been done with this stuff. Um, you know what, someone asked that, and I didn't get him a question, but I didn't get his answer back. Um, he wanted to know when did we start using that? No, no, those valves, those valves, that's a good idea. I like that. The excess flow valves, like right? One-way valve, yeah. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, that's what he asked. He asked when did we start oh, using wonderful. it. And uh, I didn't get an, get an answer to that, but We've been using it as long as I've been around here. I've been at NICOR for 13 years, okay? Those valves are on all residential and small commercial, okay? Those residential, um, you will know 
I attach this little tag here, this little silver tag here. That lets us know if your meter has an excess flow valve, if your gas service has an excess flow valve. I just, I just attached it to this for purposes of this video, or this um, training, but this tag will be right at your meter set. So we can walk up to your meter set and look at this tag and it says excess flow valve. We'll know, okay, this home has one, okay? Every home, should, every home, residential, and small commercial should have an excess flow valve now, all right? So if you ever get problems of low pressure, um, you're not getting good pressure in your home, that's one of the things we look at. Has that excess flow valve tripped? Is it a faulty valve or whatever? You're not getting good pressure. It's not allowing 60 pounds of pressure to come up to this regulator, okay? I'll talk a little bit about, re about regulators, pipeline stations, um, and uh, a little bit about mercury. This is a pipeline station, okay? It's fenced off, locked off for a reason, okay? Because we don't want anyone in there. There's nothing you guys can do in there. There's nothing we can do in there. Yes? Um, I know we have one up in Rockford. I'm not sure if we have one right in this area. Yeah, uh, we have vaults. And I'll go, and then the next side, slide is a vault. These are um, basically locked for a reason. You can't do anything in there. We can't, I can't do anything in there. There's a problem. We have a special system operations department that can handle whatever going, whatever needs to happen in there. But basically, these are transmission lines, okay? From our interstate pipelines, these are transmission lines going into those stations. Usually around 600 pounds of gas is going into there. And one uh, purpose of this station is to regulate that pressure down to about 300 pounds, okay? So you may have 600 pounds going in, the station regulates that down to about 300, 200, 150 pounds. Some stations also is where the mercaptan is added. That's, that smell is added to the gas. Then we have vaults, okay? Same department maintains these vaults, our system operations department. And here, the pressure, the vaults are underground, pressure's coming in at 150, 200 pounds, and the vaults regulate that down to 60 pounds. Okay, now that's the pounds that's in a regular gas main out in the parkway of, your, of a residential neighborhood, 60 pounds. So once it leaves the vault, it's coming in at 60 pounds. It's coming out at 60 pounds. First aid regulators, I don't know if any of you guys ever seen these out in rural areas. Uh, some of the old timers call them farm taps because they're usually by farms, okay? These are just regulators on our transmission lines. So we may have a transmission line out on, let's say, Cicero or Harlem Avenue. We may have a 300 pound transmission line. Well, you don't want 300 pounds feeding right up to a customer's home. This rig can't handle that type of pressure. This first stage regulator knocks that pressure down to 60 pounds, okay? This regulator is designed to handle 60 pounds, okay? So that knocks it down to 60 pounds. Now you can feed a customer's home with 60 pounds. And this regulator knocks the pressure down to one quarter of a pound. That's what's going into your home, one quarter of one pound, okay? So that's called the first stage regulator because this, in an essence, becomes the second stage regulator if the customer has a first stage regulator out, out in the park or out in the, near the street of their home. That becomes the first stage, this becomes the second stage. These are just pictures of uh, large um, industrial meter sets and different type of uh, regulators, different valves. Um, the main thing here is anything that's locked on, leave it on. Anything that's locked off, leave it off, okay? So don't, don't turn on anything that's already, on, uh, already off and don't turn off anything that's already on. These are the valves we want you guys to be concerned with, the red valves. Those are your guys' valves. So that's the valves that we want you guys to operate if you ever need to shut down the meter set at a school. And this is just a regular residential meter set. Not too much different from this guy here, okay? We have the riser, the high pressure valve, do the regulator, meter, 
NICOR's responsibility ends right there, right at the outlet. So our responsibility will end here. Everything down from there, downstream from there, is the customer's responsibility. If they have leaking on that pipe right here, or any pipe inside their home, that's their responsibility. We will come out and make a repair on it if you have a, a leak on it, but there will be a charge, okay? But we will repair it. Mercury, you'll notice a mercury regulator by the way it sits. It sits horizontal versus vertical, okay? Most of the uh, mercury is out of our system, but we still have, we, we still run across mercury every now and then. We have a special mercury department that will go out and dispose of this mercury regulator. Uh, if there's a mercury spill, we have a special department that goes out and clean up the spill. They put on their special um, clothing and booties and gloves and go out and dispose of that mercury, okay? Back in the day, I know we used to play with mercury as kids, and there was no problem with it, but now it's a big deal, okay? Environmentally, we have to dispose of it in the right way. I mentioned this uh, customer convenience valve. I guarantee none of you guys have this on your meter sets at home, this valve right here. This is the valve right there. That's something new we just started last year, a couple years ago, no, last year. Um, basically what this says, what this valve does is, this is the customer's valve, by the way. Remember, our responsibility ends here, so this valve becomes the customer's. And this is for basically, if I come out to your home, I made a repair to the gas line, okay? Now I need to restore gas service to your home, but you don't allow me inside your home for whatever reason, okay? So now I can't get in to check your appliances to make sure, making sure, to make sure they're operating properly. I can't make sure if there's a leak once I turn your gas back on inside and you don't allow me in, okay? Typically, we'll just leave you locked off. But now we're saying, okay, customer, we'll turn you back on right here, but we're gonna lock you off right here at this valve. We're gonna install one of these valves while we're there and leave it locked off. Not locked, but closed off. So we, we won't put a lock on it. And we're telling you, once you're ready, to turn yourself back on, or once you've had a contractor or a plumber inspect your appliances, then you can turn yourself back on, and NICOR will not be liable for the inside of your home, since you didn't allow us in. So we can't be liable for something we didn't check and inspect, okay? Any questions with that? Okay, so we'll turn you back on here, we'll provide you gas service, it's up to you to turn yourself back on, or your contractor to turn yourself back on right here. We'll install that valve, it is a cost to the customer, Put it right on their gas bill, okay? But this becomes their responsibility now because they didn't allow us in, okay? It'll be years before everyone has one of those if everyone even gets one. We have a lot of customers that are very cooperative and let us in. Even if they have electronic ignition, they still let us in to inspect their appliances, okay? That's the safe thing to do. You're basically trusting them to do the right thing. Correct, correct. And they should be trusting their contractor to do the right thing. So they may not, they may just say, hey, I'll turn myself back on, I have electronic ignition, I know what I'm doing, do not leave me locked off, but I don't want you in my home. Okay, we trust you, okay? But we can't show up in court later if something happened inside when you denied us access. Obviously we can't force ourselves into your home, but we will leave you gas. We do periodic surveys on our services, our mains, all of our utilities. Um, that guy is just basically walking with a, a Sensit or UltraTrack with a drag tube, just walking, inspecting our services, checking for leaks. We do system surveys every three to five years on public school build, uh, public buildings like schools, hospitals, churches. Okay, we do those every three to five years. Business areas, we do those every year. Those are strip malls where. The main is not in the parkway, there's no parkway. The main is actually uh, in the alley or, or out near the front door of the strip mall under, under pavement. We do those annually. And our interstate mains and transmission lines, those are the big boys, the 24 and 36 inch lines in diameter with 250, 300, 600 pounds of gas in them. We check those weekly, okay? We'll have someone in a helicopter flying over these lines every single week checking to see if anyone's digging around those lines. 
without us knowing about it. Okay? We should have someone from our watch and protect department watching those guys dig if they're digging around a transmission line. Very bad things can happen if a contractor hits a transmission line with 600 pounds of gas in it. Okay? Not only that, it'll be a very long day to make a repair on a pipe that's 36 inches in diameter. Okay? So we check those weekly. Uh, we check exposed mains four times a year. Water crossings five years inside facilities. We need to get inside your home. If your meter is inside, we need to get inside, inspect our meter set, piping every five years, vertical risers, um, steel services going up the side of a building, okay? That's exposed to the elements. We need to check those every three years in case crossings, okay? That picture up there, anything looks, can you notice anything in that picture? Divide up, overpass. Flower What's that? Flower beds on top. <laughs> you know, you're the second one that has ever said that. <laughs> flower beds. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I said it's you, it's you. <laughs> right there is a gas main. That's a gas main running under there. It's exposed to the elements, okay? Any pipe that's exposed to the elements will be steel. Okay, so those types of exposed mains, we need to inspect those quarterly, basically every four years, every, every four times a year. This type of stuff will never be exposed above ground. Okay, this can't be uh, out in the sun for two years. If it's, if it's in the sun for more than two years, we have to scrap it. Even if it's sitting in our yard, brand new coil of PE, it's been in our yard for two years, we have to get rid of it. I'll actually pass this back around so you can see a date. We have a date on all of our plastic. Okay? How about plastic lasted for you know years, like water bottles, you know, don't don't degrade? Yeah, I mean, it takes like I don't know, hundreds of years or something. No, like it's it's well awesome. not when you have, not when you have gas flowing through it. Oh, okay, okay. But you know, that stuff will last a hundred years if it's underground. Okay. Above ground, the sun will start jeopardizing the integrity of that pipe. Okay? So, a water bottle or whatever, a little bit different than polyethylene with, you know, 60 pounds of gas flowing through it. And plus it's not safe. I mean, yeah. kids walking by, you know, with a stick or whatever, anything can happen. As a matter of fact, even if 10% uh, of the thickness of that pipe is jeopardized, so like the, the thickness of a dime, okay? So if anyone puts a gouge in here, we have to replace that section, okay? This stuff is very, I wouldn't say it's very soft, but you know, bad things can happen. You know, it doesn't take much to puncture. Okay. Is that steel the whole way, I mean, I understand like across the bridge, so like once it gets back to ground level, is that still steel like continuing like under the ground level? Good question. Female Cicero, 3024 So we can have mixed material. It can be steel and plastic mixed together. For the most part, if it's steel, it's steel all the way through. Okay. But we can have mixed material. We can have some plastic mixed with steel. I told you how we squeeze plastic off, right? This is a six inch main. Look at the wall thickness of there. You may be surprised how quickly we can squeeze this thing down. Okay? Anything above eight inches will always be steel. Okay? Less than eight inches, we can still use uh, plastic. Julie, we tell our customers, call Julie, it's free. You need to dig. 811, that's the right thing to do. Okay? They'll come out within 48 hours and mark your service. Natural gas markers, just letting people know, hey, there's a there's a gas main under here. Be careful. Farmers, there's a high a high transmission line under 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 your uh, property there. Be careful while you're digging. 
I got a little cut out here of one so you can see what it says on it, but it's basically just a warning saying that there, there's a gas line there. Now I'm going to get into some types of emergencies, okay? We have natural gas leaks, just leaks on customers' piping, leaks outside on our services, leaks on mains, little pinhole leaks, corrosion leaks. We have main services and hits, okay? Where the contractor hit our main or hit our services, and uh, now, now it's not only a leak, that's what we call gases blowing. Then explosion in the fires, you guys know all about those. I mean, I'll go into a slide a little bit later. Uh, of what of the explosive limits, the explosive levels of gas. So natural gas leaks on the customer's piping. Remember anything here on customer's piping? You can have leaks on those. You can have leaks on these appliance connectors. You guys know the brass connectors on your appliances, your ranges, your ovens. If it's brass, get rid of them. That's brass. As a matter of fact, if we go in your home and we find that, we have to leave with it. We must take it out, okay, and replace it. We have the new ones on our trucks, so we will replace it. There is a charge. We will charge you for it. No money, no money is exchanged while we're there. We'll put it right on your bill, okay, but we'll install a new one. Per the ICC, Illinois Commerce Commission, we have to take those with us. They are dangerous. What's the charge for that? You know, I want to say they're like 60 bucks to, to install. 60? Yeah. And I know you can get them cheaper. Okay. This is a stainless steel one. This is a, um, a coated stainless steel one. They're both better than the brass ones. All right. But we have to leave with it. If you don't allow us to leave with that pipe, Okay, we're not gonna stand there and fight you over it. We're gonna valve off that appliance though. Okay, we'll valve off that appliance, cut that, cut that, cut that connector, cap that line, okay? Then like I said, it's up to you to go ahead and get your own connector, have your contractor or do it yourself to go ahead and uh, install it yourself, okay? But we can't be responsible for a leak that happens when we were just there, okay? I'll get into leak classifications. Meter sets, basically here, you can have, you know, all of these are just, you know, fittings, nipples, valves, so they can leak. The threads can leak. You can have a leak on the meter dial. You can have a leak anywhere here. So before we leave this meter set, we'll soap it down. If we see any bubbles or anything, we know we have a problem and we don't leave until it's corrected. Then the outside leaks are basically, you know, the service hits you have leaks that's venting outside in the parkway. So what do you do if you smell natural gas? You basically act fast. That's what we tell our kids. They can remember that. Smell gas, act fast. Don't delay, get away. That's what we tell the kids at the fire department open houses. They can remember that. Okay? We pass these around to the kids at the fire department open houses. Okay? They want to know how gas smells, how the mercaptan smells. We got a little scratch and sniff we pass around. They can scratch it, see how gas smells, and know that if they smell that in their home, to let their parents know. Okay? Tell our customers dial 888 nightcore for you if you do have a gas leak. Or if you suspect a gas leak outside while you're walking your dog. Dial 888 nightcore for you, 642-6748. Say natural gas emergency. A ticket will be generated. Dispatcher gets that ticket to our first responder. Our first responder gets to the job site within 30 to 60 minutes to investigate that leak and put a grade to it. They grade the leak. Okay. All of our employees from the meter reader on up to the senior technician will knock on the doors when they go to customers home. Okay. Doorbells are sources of ignition. So we train our employees, knock on the door, don't ring the bell. It takes about 1,100 degrees to ignite gas, and that doorbell could be a source of ignition. So what do you do if you have gas escaping inside? You evacuate the structure, all right? You wanna open up windows and doors to vent the, vent the place down. 
shut off open flames. If gas is entering from the outside, you want to check the basement utility entrances, cracks in the floor and foundation, and then obviously you want to shut off the gas meter. Okay? You want to shut that valve down. You don't want to feed more gas into the building. These are all sources of ignition. I know. Can you go back down? Here? Yeah, I just want to see. Okay. So, the important thing up here is the second bullet here. Do not operate electrical switches. If you go into a home or a building and gas is in the building, if the lights are on, leave them on. If the lights are off, leave them off. Okay? If you accidentally flip the light switch on, just leave it on. Don't flip it back off. Those light switches are sources of ignition. Okay? That can cause a spark. You have gas, especially if gas is uh, near that near that that outlet or that switch. Those become sources of ignition. Okay? It becomes that third leg. All you need is a fuel source, the gas, oxygen, which is the air, and then a source of ignition. Okay? I mentioned this in the previous two presentations. We had an explosion at a Walgreens in Addison a few years back. Uh, our guys were in there investigating everything, investigating around the perimeter of the Walgreens. Someone came in and just flipped on the switch. The Walgreens blew up. Okay? Because there was a pocket of gas behind the wall. This is the light switch. There's gas in the wall behind that switch. Once they flip the switch, boom, it exploded. Okay? So all of these are sources of ignition. Light switches, telephones, um, uh, flashlights that aren't intrinsic. Are those uh, yeah. structural? Yep. Your, your structural ones are intrinsically safe. Yeah, unless they're intrinsically safe. They're not. They're not. Okay. The old, old radio But well, we don't have any. So we give our guys intrinsically safe flashlights. We tell them to leave their uh, cell phones in the truck when they're working around gas. Obviously overhead power lines can be sources of ignition. All the bells and whistles on your, on your engines can be sources of ignition, okay? This is just a guy showing you that he's doing some leak detection, using his sensor, sniffing for gas. Okay, those things are ultra sensitive. So they will pick up gas, but the number one way to pick up gas, customers know it. Their nose, they, they know that smell, okay? So they're out walking their dog. Even if we can't pick it up right away, you can get a whiff of, you can get a whiff of that gas, whiff of mercaptan, you'll know if something is leaking, okay? So even if we can't find it, we'll have some of our technicians out there saying, hey, I smell something as soon as I pulled up, okay? So we know we don't leak. We gotta we gotta grade that leak. We gotta find where that leak is at. Even if it's in the winter time, there's four feet of frost, and that frost is acting as a cap, and the gas is not being allowed to vent. Somebody may walk up and say, "Hey, I got a whip or something." Okay. So your nose is, is just as good, or even better, as those sensors. Another thing that's fairly new. A couple years ago, we started using these uh, fire retardant suits. Whenever we're working in a gaseous atmosphere, they're fire retardant, they're not fireproof. Um, they're basically just giving you that extra layer of protection. So if there is a flash fire in the hole, it's giving you enough time where you can get out of that hole safely. Okay? They also wear fire retardant gloves. They still always have on their hard hat and their safety vest and their steel toe boots. They'll always have that and eye protection. But now if gas is blowing, they're gonna go to their trucks, put on those suits, okay? And give them that extra layer of protection. Similar to your guys' turnout gear. Okay. So if gas escaping outside, what do you do? Clear the area. Make it safe. Okay? Put your caution tape out. Put your barricades up. And I always get the question, how far do you want us to move people back? You move them back as far enough as you need to, to, to make your area safe, okay? If you move them back this far, we're still getting gas readings here, you know what, you, you may want to expand that work area and move them back this far now. Move them back as wide as you can, okay?
okay? Because customers will want to come as close as they can to see what's going on, to take pictures, to ask questions, to look in the hole, do whatever they want to do, but they just want to know what's going on, but they don't know it's very dangerous. Move people away. We want to investigate adjacent buildings, check manholes and sewers. Once gas gets in manholes or sewers, uh, we have to get it out of there. We have to vent out those sewers, drop some vented manhole covers, pop those closed manhole covers off. That gas will migrate and you won't know where it's going to go. And then if uh, a source of gas is known, allow it to vent if possible. Clear the area. If burning through the ground, check adjacent buildings, but do not extinguish the fire if it's not posing a threat to other property and people. And that's your guys' call. You know, but if the fire is burning right here and it's not posing a threat anywhere else, just let it burn because that's letting us know the leak is right here. Once that leak, once that gas ignites, it's not gonna do anything else. It's not gonna migrate, it's gonna burn right there. That lets us know the leak is right there. Now we can formulate a plan to get it shut down. Once you extinguish that fire, guess where that gas is going to go? It's just going to go to the next path of least resistance. It may come over here now and start a fire over here. Or it may get into the sewer and come up to the, in the neighbor's, inside the neighbor's home three doors down. Okay, so let it burn. But please don't fill the hole with water if, if, if you don't have to. Okay. But remember I told you our guys get in there with those fusion boxes and fuse those new pieces together? That's an electric box, okay? Attached to a generator. So if we need to get into a hole and fuse a new piece of, piece of plastic main together, now we're getting into a hole with water with an electrical box, and that's not safe. So now we're spending another 30 minutes pumping out that hole, pumping out the water from that hole before we can make the repairs. And then obviously you want to cool your surrounding combustibles. This slide shows you the explosive levels of natural gas. Okay? Five to fifteen percent, that's the danger zone. That's five to fifteen percent gas air mixture. If it's 1% gas, that's too lean. If it's 80% gas, it's too rich, okay? Anything within this zone, any type of spark, any source of ignition could cause an explosion when the gas is at five to 15% concentration, okay? So we tell our guys, if you're in a home with 100% gas, okay? It's not gonna blow, it's too much gas, not enough oxygen. But guess what? When they start venting that building down and opening up windows and doors, guess what's going to happen to that gas? It's going to be like Yep, correct. It's eventually going to go down. It's going to go down to 90. It'll go to 70. It'll go to 50. It'll go to 10. So as you're venting that place down, gas is, the gas concentration is going down, and it's got to go right through that range before it can get down to zero. And that's the range we're, we're, we want to be aware of and, ca and, ca and cautious about. Because that's the range where flip a switch, telephone ring, doorbell ring, um, flip on a TV, static from your clothes, anything can cause a source of ignition, can be a source of ignition, and cause an explosion when the gas is 5 to 15%. Any questions with that slide? This slide is basically showing an explosion at this home, okay? This is showing the order that our first responder will check the adjacent homes and the homes in the area. Do anyone know why they would check this home first, that this is the explosion? There's a reason why we would go across the street and check that one first, always. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you both are correct. So if I have a meter here on this home, a meter there on that home, they're pretty much sharing the same ditch across the road. Even though this gas main is on this side of the street, gas main's on this side of the street, 
service T feeding this home. There's another service T right next to that T feeding that home. So the soil has been disturbed across the road, basically within a 12 to 18 inch you know, diameter. Okay, so if there's a leak somewhere here, guess where it's gonna go? It may migrate and go right up to the next home there because the soil was disturbed. They share like the same running line, okay? So you're saying like even if that fish just shows an explosion, but just like a gas leak in, in the hole, no explosion, still you guys detect it yep. across the road? Absolutely, yeah. okay. yep. A leak is just a precursor to an explosion. So even if the explosion happened here, this, way may, this may be where the leak originated. And that may still be where it's leaking. So that may very well be the next home to go while we're on site, home number one. So we always check the home across the street, okay? Obviously we can't do anything about this home now. We'll go ahead and check the surrounding area over here, try to get gas shut down here. Because if, if it's an explosion, most times it may still be a fire there. So we want to shut off the gas so it don't feed the fire. But we go across the street and check that next home. Then we check the adjacent homes to the actual explosion. Then we go across the street and check those. Okay. It's just like for an outside leak, right? Basically not an in, in the house leak. It right. Would be right. A pipe or whatever. Yeah, if you have a leak, if you have a leak on your piping, yeah. it, it shouldn't be getting across the street like that. Like an outside leak. Right. If it's outside at the parkway or outside near your foundation of your home sure. or an explosion happened. Um, an explosion happened, we don't know if it was outside or inside. All we know, gas was, your home filled up with gas and it exploded. So we must go across the street, make sure that's not the first one, the next one to go, and start venting that place down. Because gas will travel across the street because they share the same running line. Good question. Just like I said, allow it to burn unless it presents a threat to life or property. These are other odors that customers um, mistake for gas, okay? Any of those odors can be mistaken for gas. Customers call us out and say, hey, I smell gas out near back, my backyard. We'll get there investigate, it may be a, a skunk, you know? <laughs> Maybe a dead, a dead rodent or something that, that's giving them, the, uh, giving them the indication that there's gas leak out there, but it's not gas, you know? So we come out there with our, with our little senses we're searching for gas, not this other stuff. We're searching for natural gas. So we'll be able to detect if there's really a gas leak or just a foul odor. Carbon monoxide, um, basically, we tell our customers, make sure your, your appliances are working correctly. We'll inspect them before we leave. If you allow us in your home, we'll inspect them. But if you detect, if they detect carbon monoxide or their carbon monoxide detectors are going off, we send them right to you. We tell them to dial 911 or, or the, the local fire department, okay? If they feel sick, we tell them to dial 911 or the local fire department. If they just suspect a leak, we tell them, hey, go right to the fire department. So we're not the first responders on those anymore. We'll support you guys. If you need us out there, we'll obviously come out and support you. But we tell them, go to the fire department. Call the fire department for carbon monoxide leaks. <coughs> Appliance connectors, I passed those around already. Um, those are prone to leakage, especially those, those, those brass ones. It's an unacceptable one. Okay. As a matter of fact, if you pull your oven or range out from the wall and it has a brass connector, they, they recommend you replace those every time you pull, out, you pull your oven out. Okay? That's how br brittle and fragile those things are or can be. That's the old one. That's the old one, yeah. These are the acceptable ones. I passed around the bottom two. The top one is an epoxy coated one. That's the Cadillac version of, of the uh, connectors. We carry all of them. We'll replace them, okay? Or we'll just valve off that piece of appliance and you can replace them yourself. What do you notice about this picture? The grass is dead. Yep. Dead vegetation, it's a good sign that there may be a gas leak there. So we get customers to call and say, hey, I can never grow grass in that area. Sometimes I get a whiff of gas smell, but I can never grow grass or anything in this area. 
we'll come out and investigate that area because there may be a gas leak. There may be a main under there that's leaking. The gas displaces the oxygen and doesn't allow the grass or vegetation or shrubs or bushes to grow uh, properly, okay? So if our guys are riding past and they see that, they'll stop and investigate that area. They'll pound some holes in the ground, see if they have gas coming up, venting, take some readings to see if we have a leak there. And these are grades. Okay. I'll let you read through that real quickly. But this is how we grade the leaks. Our first responders, when they first get out there, before they make a repair or before they call a crew, they'll put a grade to that leak. Okay. If it's a leak on this little thing or a half inch, they can squeeze it off and make the repairs themselves. Our first responders, they're a one-man crew or a one-woman crew. Anything bigger or deeper or uh, more dangerous, then they need to call out a street crew to come with a backhoe and do some excavating. They're a two-man crew, sometimes a three-man crew. So grade one, the highest priority. Main was ruptured, 60 pounds of gas blowing, grade one. Gas inside your home, grade one. Gas outside your home, but near the foundation, within five feet of the foundation, grade one. Gas inside of a sewer, grade one, okay? Those are all grade ones. Those are all the leaks that we must fix and cannot leave that site until it's done, until it's repaired. We will not leave. If we do need to leave, another crew will be right there before we leave, even if that leak takes 36 hours to, to repair. We cannot leave that site. Gas in a sewer is a bad thing. It will migrate and come up, and it, 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 you just never know where it's going to go. Sanitary sewers, storm sewers, inside of a water main, inside of a, a, a comet conduit. Okay, now you got gas in an electrical conduit. All that stuff, grade one. Grade two, just like this type of stuff. It's out in the parkway, it's not doing any damage, it's venting in the air. Yeah, it stinks, the customer smells it when they walk in past, but it's not getting into the sewers, it's not getting into the home, it's venting up in the air. We know about it. We have 12 to 18 months to repair it, even though we must uh, periodically inspect it every six months to make sure, make sure it hasn't gotten worse. We know about it, we will repair it as soon as possible. But those grade ones, are the ones that's keeping us from getting to these grade twos in a timely manner, okay? We may have a, uh, a schedule, we may have a grade two leak schedule to be repaired tomorrow. I'm gonna send a crew out tomorrow to repair this grade two. Guess what happens tomorrow? I get three grade ones that come in, okay? That grade two is gonna have to wait now. We got gas inside of a school. We got gas in a sewer. We got gas at a customer's home. Those are grade ones, we have to take care of those first. Grade two has to wait, and a lot of times those get pushed off. Customers don't understand, like, hey, I called you guys last month, you're still allowing this to leak, you don't care, okay? I've been calling you guys. When we have to explain, they don't, they don't care about grades. All they care about is I want this thing fixed. I heard about the explosion in Chicago, I heard about the explosion in Long Road. I want this thing fixed. We, we basically tell them we have to take care of the priority ones first, okay? We do know about that leak out in your parkway, Okay, we will send someone out to repair it, but we have to take care of the emergency ones first. The leaks where gas is inside of a home. And we have those every single day. Grade three is lowest priority. Main is out in a, in a cornfield somewhere or an unincorporated area with no houses around. It's not getting anywhere. There's no sidewalk, so customers uh, don't even really smell it because they don't walk past. Um, there's no timetable that we have to repair those but we do have them on our, on our radar, and we will repair those also. It's just that the ones and twos will come before the threes. So, so a lot of times those get pushed off uh, to the last scenario, the last case, the very last, um, very last priority. Any questions with leak grading? This is the emergency contact number for you guys. 800-747-1470 for you guys to call and say, hey, how long are you guys going to be? How long is the crew going to be out? Or, hey, this situation just got worse. Now it's on fire. 
okay? Or hey, I got I I I can't have Harlem Avenue shut down any longer. How long is it gonna be? It's gonna be rush hour. I got helicopters flying above now. That's the number for you guys. If a customer calls that number, we would tell them call the 888 number. That's the 8 the 888 number is the number where it generates a ticket and gets that ticket flowing through the system. Okay? And that's the only way our first responders will get a ticket is when the dispatcher gets a call or when our customer service rep gets a call on that 888 number. That number is just for you guys. Our first responder that we talked about that goes out and grade those leaks and make the repairs on the smaller leaks, their first um, priority is secure life and then property. Assess the damage and make the repair or call a crew if they can't make the repair. Now the role of the distribution supervisor or the operations supervisor, however you want to call them, that was basically my role before this role. Our job was to assemble a crew, okay? So the first responder graded the leak and said, hey Rod, we have a class one out here. This is where I'm at, I'm at the corner of X and Y, okay? I have a 60 pound pressure system, it's blowing, I need help out here, we need a crew, okay? They're gonna have to shut down Harlem. I got the police department out here. I got the fire department out here. Our job is to call a crew. We don't have crews just sitting in the yard, so we have to call a crew. The crew may be in Berwyn, or the closest crew may be, the closest crew that's available to move may be in Lyons, maybe in Schaumburg, who knows, okay? So all of that is taking a, a toll on when, when we can get someone out there to shut that gas down. So that's what we're doing. We're assembling a crew. We're finding out how many crews we need. Do we shut it down in one spot where we only need one crew? Or do we need to dig it up and shut it down in two spots where we need two crews? So gas main. It's hit right here. Okay. Gas is only flowing one way in this system. We need to know that as the uh, distribution supervisor. We're calling back on the phone to our system planners in the office saying, hey, is this a one-way feed? If it is, and we shut it down here, we squeeze this, guess what's gonna happen to all the homes downstream of here? They're gonna go dead, because now they have no gas. And guess what may be on the end of that line? A hospital, okay? We don't know, so we're on the phone. We have to know if this is a one-way feed or a two-way feed. If it's a two-way feed, meaning gas is flowing in this direction and this direction, shutting it down here won't do anything to the, this hole right here, because now that gas is still being fed from this direction and gas is still blowing. So now we have to squeeze here and squeeze here in order to repair this section right here. But we won't know that until we're on the phone and finding out if this is a two-way feed or a one-way feed. So that's what we're doing. We're getting a crew, we're assessing the damage, we're finding out how many crews we need, we're on the phone with the system planners back in the office. Um, we're, trying, we're trying to find out where they're at, we're trying to find out uh, if media's out there so they can call me if there's media. Uh, we wanna find out how long, it's gonna, how, how long do we think it's gonna be. If we're gonna have a major road shut down for five hours and it's rush hour, we need to get on the phone, let our VPs know, okay? Our directors know back at the office because that's something they wanna hear about before hearing about it later. Uh, we're developing a safe plan, determining what type of equipment and staffing we need. If this is something that's gonna go well into the night, okay, we may need to get our second shift crew rolling this way because our first shift crew is off at 4.30. Then we need to constantly communicate with our corporate office back in Naperville. They're calling us on the phone. Hey, what's going on out there? Your eyes and ears. Is it gonna be a problem? Okay, are we gonna see this on the news? Okay. A lot of times we have to shut down a metro train because we have a leak right near the track. Okay, you got 60 pounds of gas blowing, filling up the area, and you have a metro train flying by above here. That train is a source of ignition. It could blow up while customers are on the, on, the, on the train. So a lot of times we've had to shut down trains. Okay, and that's a big deal, very big deal when that happens. Now you're backing up traffic. And you're messing with Union Station downtown. Okay, so we're constantly on the phone, we're immediately on the phone, okay, with our external affairs people saying, hey, this is what's gonna happen. Media's gonna call you, because we're gonna shut down this train. 
The VP's back in the office. Yeah, this is a big one. So I need some more personnel out here. So you're going to hear about this one, but this is what we have. So when you see us out there just talking and pointing and looking while gas is still blowing, that's the type of stuff that we're thinking about and, and doing. You can't just go in there and just start digging and, and shut stuff down when we don't know what's going on. Okay. <coughs> and number two is uh, we have to, we can't dig until Julie show up. They get two hours. And a lot of times they take all two hours before they come out there and locate those services. We can't put a shovel on the ground until Julie shows up and mark that area. So gas may be blowing for three hours before you see night court put a bucket in the ground, but those are the type of things we have to go through. Then we have to follow up and make a safe plan and uh, assess the damage and make the repairs. Make the repairs, <coughs> fuse in a new piece of PE, uh, weld in a new piece of steel, it's a steel service. Then we can open back, or tell the fire department, police department, they can open back up the road, make the repairs, backfill the hole, go back to the yard, get some gravel. So those are the type of things we do to make the area safe. Natural disasters, they happen. They can wreak havoc on our system. Um, you see this one here, electricity, okay? Um, we've had cases where electricity, lightning strikes a tree, okay? Strikes a tree, the electricity runs down to the root of that tree, jumps onto this wire. This wire is attached to that gas main and burns a hole right in the gas main. So now we got gas blowing, 60 pounds of gas blowing because there was a lightning strike that jumped down the tree onto this wire. And this wire just basically melted a hole right in the pipe. Okay? So no one hit it, but it's gas blowing. And because there's no excavation, now gas is blowing underground. That's the worst when gas is blowing underground and not being allowed to vent because guess where the gas is going to go? It's going to go laterally. You don't know where it's going to go. Um, that picture there with the flood, with the person walking, floods can wreak havoc. We had a major flood in Lyle in 2012 where we had 500 plus meters underwater. Okay, the flood in Lyle where water was up to here. Entire vehicles were underwater. The entire town of Lyle was underwater. And I had to send all of my guys out to shut off this, this valve here so we don't have gas blowing underwater, okay? And of course, they could not see the gas meter. They're walking like this in water, just reaching down, filling, trying to fill for this valve with a wrench to shut it down, okay? 500 of them. From the north end all the way to the south end of Lyle. So basically, the entire town was underwater. Where to direct questions? Basically to your uh, community relations manager, any fire, media, or police that show up on the scene, um, mainly media, they would call me or one of my four other counterparts across the Arctic Service Territory. down in Bloomington being interviewed by a media outlet down there. This is the last slide I have. That's our Troy Grove Friar School. If you haven't been, it's a good, uh, it's a good training. Very similar to this training I just put on, but it's a lot more practical, hands-on, where you can get outside and get your hands dirty and put out some fires using the dry cam. We have like six different fire props, and uh, you get a chance using the extinguishers to put out those fires. That training is every year in May. We can hold 200 to 300 people. And um, those basically, those invites will start going out within the next couple of weeks to see who's interested in coming. Where is Troy Grove? Troy Grove is basically south. Uh, you take like I-55 south. It's, it's about, a, about an hour south of, um, maybe about an hour and a half south of here. Okay. But yeah, it, it's, it's south of, um, 
south of Joliet, down south of Shanahan, so it's down there, about an hour and a half, maybe a, maybe maybe almost two hours from here. Okay, that's the last slide I have. Any other questions? All right, thank you guys.